Hello, world. Welcome to the Mile High Fi Podcast. I am Carl Jensen, here with my co-host. I'm Doug Cunnington. And we have a super awesome OG blogger guest today. Tell us who you are and what you do. My name is Paula Pant. I host a podcast called Afford Anything. Okay, so before we get into it, I'm kind of nervous here because I have a problem popping my peas, and here we have Paula Pant. So I'm going to try <laughs> really hard to uh, control my lips. I don't know where that comes from. I guess my lips. <laughs> But anyway, my my middle initial also begins with a P. Just a if if you want an added challenge. Wow. Does any Paula have, P. Pant. have you ever disclosed what your middle name is? Do you care to do it now? Oh yes. In fact, I actually have a story around it. If you have like thirty seconds for it, sure. So when I was born, the name that uh, was printed, the name I was given, the name printed on my birth certificate, is not Paula. It's Pragya. P R A G Y A. And after I moved to the United States as a, as a baby, um, I started, I don't know, daycare or preschool, and nobody could pronounce Pragya. And so my parents started to realize uh, that if I'm going to live in the U.S., I would just have an easier time going about my day-to-day -day life if I had an American name. So they bought a book of baby names, and because my initials were already PP, they told me that I could pick any name I wanted from this book of baby names as long as it began with the letter P. And so, and this is before I was like old enough to know how to read. So like my dad and I would lay in bed together and we would like go through all the P names. He would read them out loud to me, Paige, Penelope. And, you know, we narrowed it down to either Paula or Pamela. And I oscillated between the two for what felt like weeks. I don't know how long it actually was. And what ultimately drove the decision was that my parents told me I was going to have to learn how to spell my name. And Paula was one letter shorter and therefore easier to learn how to spell. So we had my name legally changed so that Paula got added to the beginning of my name, thus sliding Pragya into the default middle name position. Now, the funny part is Pragya is Nepalese for wisdom. Paula takes its roots in Latin for small or very little. So now my name is very little wisdom. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Most people don't get to choose their name. <laughs> uh, those three P's in a row, Doug, it sounds a little bit like a tongue twister. Can you say them fast, Doug? Oh, gosh. It's pragya? Is that how you say it? Yeah. Paula Pragya Pant. Not fast, but <laughs> it's something you could practice. Oh, pretty good. I'm not even going to attempt it because you'd have to edit it out with all my copy. <laughs> very good. So the topic of today is inflation. So it's, it's very timely and... I'm I'm kind of excited to learn because I I don't know much about monetary policy in in general, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna lean on y'all. Yeah, help me out. and the cool thing is Jerome Powell is testifying right now, so pretty timely and coincidental. And yeah, I I'm gonna learn a lot too. I was looking at Paula's notes, and I'm like, holy shit! I thought I knew about this stuff, and then I looked at her <laughs> notes, and so I've got some very pointed questions that I hope you can answer, Paula. We'll we'll see. I'll start with some of the, the easy questions, like what is the cause of the inflation that we're seeing right now? <laughs> well, it, there's a distinction, I suppose, between a, a, a question that's succinct uh, with a complicated, but, a, but an answer that's complicated. So there is not one silver bullet that's causing inflation. There are factors on both the, if you think of inflation as reflective of supply and demand, there are factors on both the supply side and the demand side that are influencing uh, what we're currently experiencing now in 2022. So on the demand side, there's pent up demand, consumer spending, which is the greatest driver of um, spending in the US economy. Like there's a lot of pent up demand coming from the fact that we've been cooped up for the last 18 months, 18 plus months. Um, you know, most of us during the year 2020 were at home. We couldn't go to sporting events. We couldn't travel. So now that the shutdowns have lifted, people are vaccinated, there's a lot of pent-up spending demand, a lot of pent-up consumer demand. And people who, you know, we, we had a sort of a bifurcated economy in which some people, there, there were massive job losses in certain sectors, but there were other sectors in which incomes stayed stable or rose, uh, such as people who were able to work remotely in the tech sector, for example, income stayed stable or rose. Portfolios grew in almost every asset class. So people are feeling richer on two fronts. They've got cash that they've saved from by virtue of not having anywhere to go for all of 2020 and 2021. 
And they're feeling richer because their portfolio balances are higher. So anyway, all of that leads to a bunch of demand, uh, which is fueling the demand side. And of course, stimulus checks as well um, also just fuels more of that consumer demand. So you've got tons of demand. And then flip over to the supply side, you've got massive supply chain sh- problems. Like the pandemic caused huge supply chain disruptions that we are still feeling and will probably continue to f- feel until well into 2023. And on top of that, there's also a labor shortage. So when you know the supply side, you've fundamentally got two factors. You've got labor and materials. We've got shortages in both of them. So now you've got crunched supply, high demand, boom, it's a recipe for inflation. What is the cause of the labor shortage? If, if you walk around town, I was walking around Longmont the other day and every place is a help wanted sign. And mm-hmm. another another place had an ominous sign that said, please be patient. We can't find anyone to work for us. It's going to take a long time. Are these new jobs or what's going on here? I can't quite figure it out. Well, so the labor shortage began when uh, in in 2020 when stimulus checks were going out to many people, not just the stimulus checks, but the, uh, the enhanced unemployment benefits. Uh, when enhanced unemployment benefits were being distributed, many people, depending on their, their job and their income level, found that it was equally or more lucrative to not take a position than it was to take a position. So, um, you know, why would you give up your enhanced unemployment benefit to go into a job for which you would be getting paid roughly the same amount of money? It, just doesn't make sense. Um, so that was when the supply, the, the labor shortage started, and that has continued to this day. It's not as bad right now as it was back then, but um, it takes a while for that trend to dissipate. Okay. Yeah. I think most of those programs have ended now, right? Maybe not. Mm-hmm. Maybe some states still support it, but I don't I think for the most part, they're done. So we just need to wait it out, wait for these people to run out of money, perhaps, and come back to work. Well, and I think another part of it, at least what I hear occasionally is people are thinking, you know what, this job is not that great and my salary wasn't that great. So I'm just going to quit and I'll find something else. Maybe I'll take a little sabbatical or something like that. And maybe the benefits, the enhanced benefits don't really matter, but it's just people adjusting, realizing that, you know, life is short, they could work from home, the, those sort of things. Any thoughts on that, Paula? Well, I think, again, it's, it's bifurcated, right? You've got people, you've got educated knowledge workers who are able to work remote jobs, who tend to have more discretionary income. They tend to have higher savings rates. They, um, th- those are the, that's the profile of people who are most readily able to be remote workers. And because they can be remote workers, They can geo-arbitrage. They can have more flexible schedules with regard to child rearing. You know, they're enjoying all of these flexibility benefits that come with highly paid, knowledge-based remote work. And inherent in that is the freedom and the discretion to be able to take a sabbatical. Um, So you've got – you have what's sort of a K-shaped recovery where if you imagine the letter K, that – higher end of that letter K, the, you know, the, the people who are already making a good amount of money, um, the rich get richer, right? Their portfolio balances are growing, their 401ks are growing, their IRAs are growing, and um, and they're able to then uh, use that flexibility to make life d- decisions based on the type of life that they want to lead. At the other side of that letter K, you have people who are in jobs um, – that don't have significant wage growth, um, maybe a little bit, but not a ton of wage growth. Uh, they tend to be some, many of them are essential worker jobs where they may be exposed to uh, health risks. They might live in a household that has, um, you know, members of their household might have comorbidities or be at higher, you know, risk of like COVID complications. So, you know, but and so you've, you're combining that factor with uh, the fact that they're essential workers. You know, you've got greater exposure and members of the household who are higher risk. Um, and so all of those play a, 
play out a very different story at, th- at that end of the curve. Where have you noticed inflation in your own personal spending? Personally, not much. Personally, I mean, home prices are obviously higher. So if I'm looking for the next property that I want to buy, um, you know, I, certainly I notice that home prices are higher. Other than that, the reality is, and I think a lot of the people who are listening to this podcast can probably relate to this experience, once you have a certain level of discretionary or disposable income, the difference in your grocery bill, sure, it's perceptible, but it's not going to keep you up at night. Um, so, you know, globally, there are there are market sectors like electronic goods, vehicle production, energy, like gas prices, um, and, and of course, energy costs affect downstream products such as groceries. Sure, those are the sectors that are experiencing higher inflation. But for, I would venture to guess, the bulk of people who are listening to this podcast, the fact that we're paying more at the pump or that our grocery bills are a little higher or that an iPhone costs more than it used to uh, is maybe a for a, for a certain sector of the economy, it's a mild annoyance rather than an actual economic calamity. So I'm curious. I have a follow up question to something you said. And around here, the housing, uh, the lack of housing is real. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. I, I can't believe the the bidding wars that we have here. And I know that's going on in lots of other parts of the country. What is that coming from? Are there places that are mm. suffering with housing? These people buying houses have to be coming from somewhere, right? What's, what's going oh. on here? Oh, so there's, um, I, I actually, I did an episode. So on the Afford Anything podcast, I did a special episode that was dedicated um, purely to explaining what's happening in the housing market right now. But the to summarize very quickly, the short answer is the level of new household formation has not decreased. So new household formation, you know, when a, a minor child turns 18 or turns 21 and moves out, decides to start their own household, you know, new households are still being formed. That hasn't abated in any way. Um, a new household formation also comes from immigration. Immigration has slowed, but it's not negative. It's, you know, it's slowed from what it used to be pre-pandemic, but it's still a positive number. So you still have this new household formation. So, you know, that's fueling the demand side. But on the supply side, again, material shortages and labor shortages. So let's think about all of the factors that affect the housing market. Number one, you have, um, when it comes to a labor shortage, I mean, Housing, both new construction and renovations, is extremely labor intensive. And again, those are essential workers um, who, you know, may need to call out due to COVID or due to getting a known exposure or or who may choose not to work because a member of their household has uh, high, you know, has diabetes or has some sort of higher risk and they don't want to risk the health of their household member. So labor shortage there. You've got huge, huge disruptions in the lumber market, and particularly homes that are built in the United States are very lumber intensive. Now, that's as compared to homes in other nations where, you know, those homes might be built by from cinder block, right? Lumber is not going to affect the the prices of homes in countries that are highly, you know, where where the materials used are cinder block, for example. But that's not how we build in America. We build based, we build a very, very lumber intensive um, home. And everything about the lumber chain from, from sawmilling to lumber processing in, in the factories, every single step of that supply chain process got disrupted due to COVID. So, um, and when it comes to like milling lumber, that is so capital intensive that when lumber prices spiked, you know, it's it's natural to say, well, hey, lumber prices spiked, shouldn't the lumber bill mills just make more lumber in order to meet that that spike in prices, right? Like, wouldn't they generate more profits if they just increased capacity? But because lumber milling is so capital intensive, you can't increase capacity at the drop of a hat the way that you could in like the tech sector. It's so capital intensive that you need a lead time of years to be able to increase capacity for milling. And we just don't have that lead time, right? That that lead time hasn't passed yet. So um, the spike in lumber prices, as well as other materials like copper, 
um, are largely driving the housing shortage, right? Because once things get uh, prohibitively expensive, it's no longer worth it for builders to build. Yeah. One other follow-up question. One of my favorite posts from mm-hmm. Afford Anything was the one where you shoot down the the notion of home ownership. Uh, you, you make a strong case for renting in there. So what would you say to someone now who said, well, I bought my house two years ago and I'm, I'm up 25%, blah, blah, blah. What would you say to that person? Well, I would say um, zooming taking a step back and zooming out, if a person is justifying a decision based on a single anecdotal case study, then they're using an incorrect thinking framework. Because what we care about is not any given cherry-picked data point. What we care about is probabilistic thinking um, that is rooted in a framework that starts with objective, all right? And then goes in, you know, you, you you timeline your goals, you know what your objectives are. Based on those objectives, you look at different strategies that might lead to allow you to achieve said objective. And then within the framework of each strategy, you weigh the risks and the rewards in a probabilistic manner, right? That's a thinking framework that allows for s- sound decision making. But if a person cherry picks a single data point, and I I get that that single data point is your own life and therefore it's emotionally resonant, but it is still not (laughs) intelligent decision making, you know, and, uh, and that's not to say that it isn't, that it wasn't a good, that it didn't have a good outcome, right? So imagine that you are driving a car and you run a red light and there's no negative outcome. You don't get into a car accident. You don't get a speeding ticket. You reach your destination faster. Was running a red light a good idea? No, it was a bad idea, but it was a bad idea that happened to have a positive outcome. But we know that if you repeat that experiment 10,000 times, then in aggregate, that that experiment probabilistically will have a negative outcome, meaning it is a EV negative, expected value negative decision right? And that's the reason that we don't pick one singular data point, cherry pick that that single anecdotal case study. That's the reason that I don't like have people on my podcast to tell their life story. Who the F cares? You know, <laughs> like no one is going to learn from a single anecdotal case study. That's my philosophy. Like it's misleading to think that we can gather narratives and form any cohesive thinking or decision-making framework based on a loose collection of assembled narratives. Yeah, there's some name for the cognitive bias associated with mm-hmm. this type of thinking, and I don't know what it is, but... Yeah, but, yeah. that's a good good point. Yeah, well, and we're going to have to rethink how we bring guests on the <laughs> podcast then. Uh, we're going to let a life stories... How's my... I know my answers are like going long, um, but yeah. No, no, th- this is great. We have a very... Uh, well, you listen to an episode. We go on tangents mm-hmm. and stuff. This is probably one of the most uh, like informational and kind of directed episodes that we've done. So the, I think your answers are great. Yeah, that last Ooh. one was really, really great. And that can awesome. be applied to so many other things, man. Yeah. Okay, so I think the next question actually came from Doug, and he's asking if this inflation is transitory or if it's going to stick with us for the long term. Whether or not the current inflation that we're experiencing is transitory is a matter of debate. But what we know is that in December of 2021, the annual rate of inflation was reported at 6.8%, which is the highest that it's been in about 40 years. And if you look at the rate of inflation, so that so that was the annual rate across all of 2021. But if you look at inflation specifically in the month of December, it was actually higher than that, which points to you know, the the trend line of inflation increasing even beyond that 6.8%. Now, bear in mind, the Fed likes to keep inflation ideally at around 2%. So this is significantly higher than the, the, the Fed's target. Now, in the, infl- the great inflation debate, there are doves and there are hawks. Um, and, uh, you know, just as, just as there are bulls and bears in the stock market, right? There's doves and hawks in inflation. Um, and hawks, who tend to be more worried about inflation say this is a serious concern and the money supply is far too free-flowing and we need to take this very seriously. 
So they do not believe it's transitory. They believe it is like a five alarm fire. Doves say the opposite. They say, you know what? This is due to temporary supply chain bottlenecks. So chill out. We're going to be okay by the end of 2022 or, you know, by early 2023. Some, you know, by, by like fall, winter, we should be fine. So that's the debate that's happening right now. And if you just had to guess, we won't hold you to it, but what do you think? I am concerned about how much the Fed's balance sheet has blown up. You know, we've seen the the Fed's balance sheet double. We have seen the printing of money in the last year and a half in a way that we have never printed money before. Um, and so I, I am concerned about the money supply. In When we discuss inflation, there are two factors that we need to think about. One is, is the supply of money that's out there. And that tends to be what gets the most attention. The second is the velocity of money. Velocity of money refers to the rate at which money changes hands between parties. The Fed can control through, you know, through its various, through interest rates and through QE, the Fed can control the money supply, but it's very difficult to control the velocity of money. That is directed entirely by participants in the market, you and me. And so the concern that I have is that, is that the money supply is, is that we've printed a lot of money and the Fed's balance sheet is big. And so the money supply side of the equation already doesn't look good. And then the other side of the equation is outside of anybody's locus of control. And so pair those two together and it doesn't really paint for a pretty picture. Got it. And the velocity of the spending, does that drive up inflation because uh, demand's higher, people are buying things more quickly? Mm -hmm. So is that the exactly. idea? Exactly. 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 So if you had a huge money supply, but everybody was just stuffing their dollars under their mattress and no one was spending, then, um, you know, that, that, that would pose different problems for the economy, but it wouldn't create inflation. I, I was going to ask you, do you... You studied it a little bit before um, before we started recording. Did you know all of this shit beforehand? <laughs> Did, is this in your brain already? So I, the podcast episode that I referenced, the one about the housing supply shortage, that's a question that I uh, received a lot in 2021 from uh, listeners to my podcast and students in my course who were, you know, of course, naturally very worried about the fact that home prices were rising so rapidly. And so the first thing that I studied specifically was uh, why home prices were going up so quickly and everything associated with that, you know, the, the supply, demand, uh, upstream supply chain, inflation, um, interest rates, uh, mortgage interest rates, where they're expected to go. So aspects about this conversation, you know, if you think of what's happening in the housing market as one example of this broader conversation that we're having right now about inflation, um, where I started was with that one specific subset, you know, the, the specific uh, example of housing. And um, I guess that was one like anchor point that I had in the ground through most of 2021. And then concurrently, the other thing that was happening was the crypto markets were uh, really blowing up. And the more I listened to, and, and I did a, right around the 4th of July of 2021, I did an in-depth episode. It was called Bitcoin for Beginners. And it was this very in-depth episode about uh, what's happening in the world of cryptocurrency. And while I was researching, and I, I put more research into that episode than I have put into any episode I've ever done uh, out of, you know, 350 episodes. Yeah, that It was a monster pain in the butt. It took a very long time to do that one. But one thing that I noticed as I was uh, researching that episode was that a lot of people in the cryptocurrency space were drawn to crypto and were speculating in crypto because they were worried about the money supply. And so that also sent me down the rabbit hole of learning at least the basics about um, the Fed's monetary policy. So I, I suppose those two 
specific use cases, cryptocurrency and housing. Those were the two that I was pretty familiar with in 2021. And then when you invited me to be on this podcast to talk more broadly about the the parent umbrella topic of inflation, which is that overarching topic, um, you know, that that unites both crypto and housing together, um, that was when I, I took that sort of zoomed out approach and um, pulled some thoughts together on how all, how all of these components tie together. Impressive. I did listen <laughs> to the uh, crypto episode, so all your work paid off. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So when people talk about inflation, I find that the consumer price index is most often what people talk about. Is that an accurate representation of, of inflation? No, um, it is. Here's an analogy that um, I guess any sociologist would probably laugh at or, you know, mm -hmm. it, given knowing laugh to. But the the CPI is to inflation as the census is to demographic data, meaning it is a robust calculation. It is a, you know, one of the better ones that we have, but it has a lot of flaws. So, you know, sociologists, I majored in sociology in college, um, and, you know, many sociologists are very critical of the census because of all of the ways that it fails to collect certain data. I'm Nepalese, and there is no... Uh, uh, line on the census for Nepalese. I'm classified as other Asian. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so you know, the census has its flaws, but it's one of the best things we've got. The CPI is also like that when it comes to inflation. One, one point you brought up earlier, uh, there's like a kind of a big missing piece in the CPI, right? Yeah. I, I, Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think housing is included in the CPI. Right. How, housing, I know some of those those biggest line items are not uh, reflected in the CPI. You know, the CPI is meant to be a measure of household day-to-day -day spending. Um, you know, how much are you spending at the grocery store? How much are you spending on utilities? Uh, those are kind of some big points to overlook. Do you think inflation hits different people in different ways, uh, for example, I was listening to a podcast yesterday, the Animal Spirits podcast, and they were talking about mm -hmm. wealthier people tend to spend more online, and online mm -hmm. the prices are cheaper. So unfortunately, the people they maintain that the people hit hardest by inflation, these day-to-day -day purchases, were people in lower socioeconomic groups. I would agree with their conclusion, but for different reasons. So I agree with the conclusion that the people hit hardest are people in at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum um, for a variety of reasons. Number one, anytime there's any disruption in, in uh, our economy, whether it's unemployment or inflation or, uh, you know, underemployment, I mean, it, it's always the lower income groups that bear the brunt of it, you know, that get it the worst because they have the least amount of cushion they have the least margin of error i mean look at you know look at what happened in in march and april of 2020 like when the pandemic first began it was the people without an emergency fund who were the most stressed right people with discretionary income were fleeing the cities to go to their second homes in the countryside um so that they could wait out the pandemic with, you know, a bigger backyard, while people who couldn't come up with $400 for an emergency um, were sweating about the fact that they clean houses for a living. And because of the pandemic, um, their clients have canceled on them, but they're a 1099 contractor, so they don't have any kind of unemployment. And, you know, eventually that problem got, got you know, addressed by virtue of freelancers being able to claim some of those uh, government funds, but there was some there were scary moments. So anyway, that's a bit of a tangent, but uh, but that is to to highlight the fact that it's always the people with the least say the the smallest safety net, the least margin of error, uh, and the lowest incomes who get hit hardest by everything. It isn't just online. I I wouldn't say online shopping is the culprit. I would I would say online shopping is um, one of many symptoms but yeah um, it, yeah yeah and the way 
we live, like we hardly leave the house at all. So we don't have to worry about vehicle purchases, which have gone crazy. We don't have to worry about buying fuel. So yeah, I was going to say the last time I filled up was probably, I mean, it could have been a month ago. I don't even remember <laughs> that like it's, it's kind of crazy. I just hardly drive. Yeah. So you mentioned interest rates before. So what should we be thinking about when maybe interest rates are going to go up to curb inflation? Interest rates are incredibly low and have been low for years. So certainly they have nowhere to go but up. We don't know when. I mean, I think there's a reasonable chance that it could happen at some point in 2022. Um, there have been some statements made, you know, in specific statements made to that effect. But we don't know exactly when, and we don't know by how much. And we don't know, I think it's wise to question whether or not it matters. So for the average person who's listening to this podcast, if Joe and John Smith want to buy a house together, wouldn't it be most prudent to buy a home when they are in a financial position to be able to do so, meaning they've paid off their credit card debt, they have an adequate emergency fund, they've saved enough of a down payment, they have enough job security, right? Wouldn't it be prudent to make the decision based on those factors rather than based on fear that their mortgage might be 50 basis points higher than what it otherwise would have been, right? Uh, I think from a personal finance perspective, you m make the vehicle purchase, the home purchase, the whether or not you take out student debt, you know, you make those decisions based on the circumstances of your personal finances. And you try to get the best interest rate that you can at the time that you make that choice. But uh, don't let the tail wag the dog. You know, don't rush to take out, don't rush to buy a home before you're really ready, just because you're worried that interest rates might go up in six months or in a year. And if interest rates actually do go up, that'll probably put some downward pressure on housing prices too. So you might be paying less than you expected for a home. Not necessarily, actually. Uh, historically, if you look at the correlation between home prices and interest rates, that uh, trend has not played out. Really? Okay, cool. Well, mm -hmm. we both own homes, so I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, so we're all right. Very good. What do you think about investment strategies? My my portfolio happens to be heavy growth stocks. Um, I'm an index investor now, but I have all these holdover stocks before I knew what an index fund was. And I know recently there's been threats of interest rates going up and holy crap, I, I don't really care that much. I watch it for entertainment purposes, but man, my portfolio, I think it was down 10% in like the past two or three weeks. Not any factor to do with the stocks themselves, just because people are worried about rates going up and this outflow from growth to value or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. what's, what's going on there and what should people think about? Well, I think the broader question is how much of your strategy is reactive to current economic conditions versus how much of your strategy is universal to all conditions. Because if you have an investment strategy that applies in all markets, bear market, bull market, up market, down market, inflationary market, uh, <laughs> deflationary markets, you know, um, stagflationary market, like, you know, if, if you have a strategy an investment strategy that is rooted in um, in principles that apply no matter what's going on, no matter what the noise is, and it's a strategy that you can stick with for 30 years or 40 years, then, then I would say there's no reason to pay attention to the noise. Now, if you want to have a component, like a fun component of your portfolio, we'll say 10% or less, where you get to dance in and out of various uh, fleeting interests based on what's happening in the broader world. You know, you can dive into value stocks because you think that we're going to go into an inflationary environment and you think that value stocks might outperform this year. Cool. Take a, a fun component of your portfolio that you decide is going to be the reactive component and, and sure, uh, go knock yourself out, have a great Friday night. But um, for the your core portfolio should be asset allocated among a variety of asset classes that's reflective of your timeline and your goals, and it should be re rebalanced periodically. And there's really nothing to do beyond that. 
Do you have a fun component in yours, Carl? I don't. I think dancing <laughs> in and out of stocks is a massive, massive mistake. Uh, when I ask this question, I do own these stocks and they have gone down, but it doesn't bother me at all because my strategy is long term. I, I think anyone who wants to dance in and out of things, thinking that they can time the market, is going to look back in decades and realize they probably lost a lot of money doing that. So, And what about you, Polly? It sounds like you have a little a fund fund. Yeah, yeah, I have a fun fund for sure. So I've got my uh, I've got my Robinhood account where I like to um, play in the world of individual stocks, but uh, you know, and I have a cryptocurrency allocation. But yeah, but I but I keep it to less than ten percent of my overall portfolio, and uh, and I recognize it just as as the fun. You know, it's it's the fun part. Nice. Yeah. Doug, how about you? Did you get sucked into the whole Game Stock meme stock thing? Did you bet half your net worth on, on GameStop or AMC or whatever these other? Ones Luckily, were? no. Luckily, no. But you know, we just recorded the crypto episode, so I am I'm going to start playing around a little bit coming up soon. So cool. Should be fun. All right, we've had low inflation for years, and does that have an impact? on inflation now? Does it sort of like build up and then, you know, expand? Not ex not exactly. So it isn't the case that inflation happens on a given timeline, where if it just hasn't happened for a number of years, then we are eventually due for one. Um, you, you know, people, as a quick aside, people often mistakenly think the same thing about recessions, um, you know, you heard, I heard so many people in my audience in 2016, 2017, 2018, they were like, geez, we haven't had a recession. And so it's been eight years since the last recession. Now it's been nine years. Now it's been 10 years. Um, you know, aren't we due for one? Right. But, and they, they think that because they have learned that historically the recessions have happened every X number of years. Um, and so they, they kind of set their watch to it. And that's a mistake. And and so similarly, setting your watch to inflation, uh, hey, it's been we've had a low inflationary environment for many years. Aren't we due for a period of high inflation? Um, similarly, also a mistake uh, because bull markets don't die of old age, um, and low inflationary environments. All, and the same applies to low inflationary environments. They don't they don't die of old age. In both cases, recessions and high periods of high inflation. There are underlying economic fundamentals that drive the next situation that we're in. And by the way, the reason that I'm talking about both recessions and inflation, the reason I'm incorporating both into this answer is because balancing, you know, monitoring inflation and keeping us from going into a, an environment of high inflation, if the Fed acts too aggressively, that could push us into a recession. So if the Fed overly tightens the money supply, if they raise interest rates and, um, you know, the give, back to the gift box analogy, they raise interest rates and they start selling off those gift boxes and they, they clamp down on the money supply a little bit too tightly, it, you know, that could have the effect of creating, of causing a recession. That's why their work is so delicate and so the thinking that a recession might happen because, well, hey, it's been 11 years, it's been 12 years, we haven't had one other than like that blip in March 2020. If we did enter a recession, it wouldn't be because it's been 12 years. It would be for all of these other underlying factors that have led to the Fed tightening its money supply excessively, which then triggered a recession, right? That would be the, the cause. It wouldn't be the, the elapsed time. Same thing with inflation. What is your take on mortgages? They're a controversial topic in the FI community, especially some people are like, I, I hate having any debt. I wouldn't take a mortgage, even if it was 0%. I personally like having one, especially if I think interest rates are going to go up. What do you think about mortgages? Well, so there are two elements to the question. There's behavioral and there's mathematical. Behaviorally, which I think is the more important aspect of the answer if having a mortgage would cause undue stress or anxiety, if it would keep you up at night, or if it would cause you to take fewer risks in other elements of your portfolio or your career, then that mortgage is not worth it. So I'll use myself as an example. I have seven rental properties, all free and clear. 
Um, and that mathematically is a super dumb decision because interest rates, mortgage interest rates are incredibly low right now. And I could easily uh, borrow against those seven rental properties, e- even at a you know relatively conservative uh, approach, let's just say I leveraged from 50-50, boom, I could expand those seven to 14, assuming a comparable price point for the next uh, seven, and you know, still have a 50% equity position to 50% debt position, which I think by any standard is, is considered still quite conservative when it comes to a mortgage, right? But the, the reason that I don't do that is because I'm running afford anything. And by virtue of running afford anything, I am investing in a small business. I'm growing a company. I have employees. I, you know, I have a lot of risk that I'm taking in the career and business element of my life, very active day-to-day big ticket risk. And so if I'm going to be high risk in a certain element of my portfolio, then I want to be low risk in an, the other elements of my portfolio. And so for that reason, um, I just don't want, I don't want to have debt so that I can run a small business, you know, or is, you know, it's a way of balancing out the risk, the aggregate risk across my portfolio rather than compartmentalizing each individual component. And so that's my answer to your question, um, to the behavioral aspect of your question of how do I feel about mortgages? There is aggregate risk across a person's not just portfolio, but life. You know, if you're in, in a, if you're a tenured college professor, you have a different level of career risk than you do if you are a um, freelance entertainer, right? And so the decision that you make about your mortgage needs to be contextualized based on the level of risk that you're taking in your career, the level of risk, uh, you know, are you single or are you a dual income household, right? There's a, a different level of risk if you've got, if you have the income diversification of a two income household, Um, versus if you don't, if you're single and it's just you and you've got to figure it out on your own, right? There's a different level of risk depending on the number of dependents that you support, uh, no matter how that generation points, whether it's children or aging parents or grandparents or overseas family members. If you come from an immigrant family and you're sending foreign remittances back to uh, the country from which you came. So all of that needs to really Uh, play into this holistic decision about whether or not you take on debt, and if so, um, what types of debt, and how much. What's your take on debt, Doug? Let's see. I'm okay with the uh, mortgage, and you brought up great points, Paula. Like Mm -hmm. We have dual income. I have a small business, um, but... I technically I could, you know, get another job. I would I would probably never do that, but technically I could get another job. <laughs> so yeah, the, the mortgage makes sense for us, uh, especially right now. So okay. yeah. All right. Well, sticking on the FI topic, how should people think about inflation and dealing with it as they're approaching FI or maybe maybe they're on their journey and we could think about people that have already hit FI as well. Mm. Well, if your strategy is sound, and that, stra- that strategy comes from first defining your objectives, timelining those goals, you know, de- deciding what had, you know, the, the defining your objective is, is essentially, you know, what is it that I'm trying to achieve? And then from there, you back into the strategies of, all right, what are the different strategies that will allow me to achieve that objective? What are the risk characteristics of each strategy? Um, What are my boundaries? What are my guidelines? Like if you go through that work of sound decision-making, then then you will already have a portfolio and a career and a life that is able to withstand all economic conditions. That being said, um, you know, there are – the reality is inflation is terrible for savers. Um, You know, if you are holding a large cash allocation – uh, as I am, like I, I have a barbell allocation, so I I don't hold bonds. I have cash and equities. And if you have a heavy cash allocation, um, inflation is terrible for that. But again, if that uh, uh, again, I'll use myself as an example. 
do I recognize that my heavy cash allocation is um, really a, a sucky position to be in at this moment? Yes. Am I going to do anything about that? No. Why? Because I formed that barbell allocation, you know, uh, equities and cash. I formed that in the context of that overall strategy, right? The uh, the strategy that I have of I'm going to invest in equities, I'm going to hold real estate free and clear, and then I'm going to devote the bulk of my time and money to growing afford anything, you know? Um, so if you think of like, F I like to think of FIRE as F-I-R-E, like financial psychology, investing, real estate, entrepreneurship. So you know, I defined all of those in relation to each other, where the investments, i.e. The, the equities slash cash barbell allocation, exists in relationship with the real estate, which is free and clear. And those exist in relationship with the entrepreneurship. So the I, the R, and the E, the ire of fire, they all exist in relationship with one another. And so, and that persists across all markets. Like, sure, the heavy cash allocation sucks because inflation sucks for savers. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that, you know, like an inflationary environment is going to affect real estate and is going to affect entrepreneurship differently, right? So again, not excessively line itemizing or not excessively compartmentalizing because in doing so you can develop an overly narrow view, but rather stepping back, taking that wide angle lens and developing this holistic view of your entire portfolio. And I include your career within that portfolio. Uh, you know, you look at your entire portfolio and say, how is this all working together as a unified system? You have a, I guess, like a unique allocation overall. Like mm -hmm. I haven't heard anyone else describe it that way. How did you, I, I suspect you got there gradually. You didn't all of a sudden mm -hmm. come up with the idea, slam everything into place. So has it been tough arriving there? D do people look at you funny you have so much <laughs> cash. Like, why are you doing this? You could be doing something else in a different way. Is there resistance internally or externally? There was internal resistance that um, fortunately has mostly abated. Uh, the internal resistance came largely from getting ca getting caught up in the noise. Like in the personal finance space and in the FI community, people love to endlessly debate minutia. Um, you know, people love to endlessly debate the... Uh, the topic of should you hold a mortgage or should you hold your home in cash? Uh, or should you, you know, I'm trying to think of another example. Uh, what's the proper equity bond split? What, you know, uh, should you transfer all of your wealth to something where the expense ratio is 0.01% lower than it is at some other brokerage, right? Like when I was in my 20s, I got really caught up in that, um, in over-optimizing, and the problem with over-optimizing is that you um, can't see the – what's the expression? Can't see the forest for the trees? Is that the expression? That sounds uh, right. Yeah. You, you miss the big picture because you're overly focused on the pixels. And you stare at pixels so long that your vision turns blurry and you forget the, the larger picture. Um, and so when I took a step back and asked myself, all right, I want to grow wealth while – having a lifestyle I love while doing work that is purposeful and that brings value to the world, right? So how do I do that? And I don't do that by chasing the best expense ratio. I don't do that by like endlessly iterating, you know, the my mortgage interest rate. Uh, I do that by focusing on, for me, I do that by focusing on entrepreneurship because that has unlimited uh, upward potential. There's no cap to it. And it's how I use my talents and skills to bring value to the world, um, to my audience, to internally, to my team, my employees. Um, you know, it's, it's how I create something. It's how I create a legacy that will outlive me. And knowing that my contributions to, to all, to, to the ire of fire, my contributions to my equities portfolio to homes that I buy and to money that I reinvest back in my business, contributions are going to be the single biggest determinant of my total portfolio gro growth, uh, using portfolio in the like broad sense of the word, to my, you know, the contributions are the single biggest determinant 
of success. And those contributions come from the use of talent and skill, not from endless over-optimization. So to your question about internal resistance, I, I was able to free myself of internal resistance when I realized that there's a trade-off when it comes to time, energy, mental bandwidth. Um, you know, we have limited cognition. And the more of my brain space that I'm dedicating towards the wrong things, towards over-optimization, uh, the less time, energy, cognition I'm able to dedicate to solving problems and building a company and making sure that the morale in my team is high, um, you know, and making sure that my audience is happy, my students are happy, creating a, even creating a great podcast episode, right? That's where my brain needs to be. Nice. That is a very, very mature outlook. I, I vow to never get into a Twitter battle about mortgages ever, ever again, because it's a stupid waste of my time. Oh, man. <laughs> now I'm thinking we could go out and troll people. <laughs> Sounds fun. Yeah, I'm trying to think. That's a, That might be a good way to end, but I think these last two we've kind of summed up, Do you th or we've already gone over, Doug. What, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's a great ending right there. We should stop there. Very good. Well, um, before we go, what's your turtle's name? I see he or she swimming <laughs> around back there a little bit. So my turtle is named Joffrey, named for the villain in Game of Thrones. Um, and I'll tell you a story about his name, but it's a, it's a bit of a Game of Thrones spoiler. So I'm going to put a spoiler alert out right now for, for everyone who's listening. Um, so, okay, spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. All right, all right, here we go. <laughs> so Joffrey in Game of Thrones is a evil king who eventually is poisoned to death. And this turtle, I found him in a swimming pool when he was like a little baby hatchling. He was clearly a newborn hatchling who had gotten separated from his little turtle family and had somehow fallen into this outdoor swimming pool. And turtles cannot be in swimming pools. The chlorine exposure will kill them. And so at the time that I pulled him out of the pool, I didn't know how long he had been in there. And if he had been in there for sufficiently long, he would have died of poisoning within the next 24, 48 hours. So I named him Joffrey so that if he ended up dying of poisoning, it, it wouldn't be quite so tragic. Um, but he survived. That was back in 2014. He survived. And, uh, you know, he's been my turtle ever since. And what kind of turtle and what's the lifespan on that, that breed? He, he is a yellow belly slider turtle, um, which is similar to a red ear slider. And the lifespan, let me look it up because it's like very, very long. Like yeah. this, this turtle is my life partner. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yellow belly sliders uh, live up to 40 years in captivity. So. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. This, this turtle and I, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be together for a, a long time. I got him in 2014. He was born in 2014. So what? He's lifespan to 2054. Solid. Should, do yeah. the cats like the turtle? Or yeah, you know the cats. Um, in my last home, the cats completely ignored the turtle, and in this home, they seem to be a little afraid of him. So oh. their their situ their their relationship seems to have regressed. <laughs> Very cool. Well, Paula, this has been absolutely amazing. Where should people find you? So I host the Afford Anything podcast. You can listen to it on the same podcast playing app that you're using to listen to this show, uh, your favorite podcast playing app. So just uh, open up the app, type in Afford Anything, and hit the follow button so that you uh, you know are subscribed to the podcast. You're following all of the the upcoming episodes. Very good. Um, I've also got, uh, if you go to affordanything.com slash show notes, I'll send you an email every time I publish uh, a new podcast episode. I'm on the email list and I listen to the show. So yeah. Awesome. People should do it. Awesome. Cool. Yeah.